And you know, one, one major rule of de-escalation is you cannot control somebody else's behavior. This is not possible. We can only control our own behavior. And by mastering that, we can influence another person's behavior. And hopefully, you know, if they're at the top of that roller coaster, we're not riding up to meet them. We're staying down at the bottom. We want them to come down to meet us because that's when we're going to actually communicate and have a conversation. That's a huge piece of another prevention aspect. And also know what our own boundaries are. You know, we're human beings. I could be the best at de-escalation and always maintaining my composure. But, you know, I have got a tipping point as well. You're listening to the Oncology Nursing Podcast where ONS Voices Talk Cancer, a resource from the Oncology Nursing Society. Through conversations with subject matter experts, we examine the important issues in oncology nursing from new treatments to patient-centered research to advancements in clinical practice. Join us as we hear from nurses in all facets of oncology care, from bench to bedside and everywhere in between. Welcome to the Oncology Nursing Podcast. Hello, and welcome to the Oncology Nursing Podcast. I'm your host, Lenise Taylor, Oncology Clinical Specialist at ONS. Today, we're talking with Chris Snyder, University of Utah Health Security Manager for the University of Utah Department of Public Safety in Salt Lake City about violence in healthcare. You can earn free NCPD contact hours after listening to this episode and completing the evaluation we've linked in the episode notes. Thanks for joining us today, Chris. Well, thank you for having me. This topic was so well received at the Tandem Nursing Conference earlier this year. I'm happy to be sharing it with a broader audience. To start, can you briefly describe the current state of violence in healthcare in the United States? I think a lot of people would probably say that it's on the rise. There are a lot of things happening currently right now when it comes to politics. And you can think about what was pre-pandemic versus during the pandemic and where we're at now, you know, it's always been an issue for healthcare. I think it's, you know, been, several studies have shown that if you work in healthcare, you know, you're more likely to experience acts of workplace violence. So I think it's important for a lot of healthcare workers to understand the whys behind that and really, you know, what resources that they can rely on for support and prevention and response. I know I transitioned and retired law enforcement. I was really surprised at the level of aggression that there is and the potential for violence. And I think if you're not inside healthcare, you really don't quite understand the, you know, the enormity of the issue there. I go back pre-pandemic to what we've seen now and a couple of theories that we have, but obviously I think, you know, a lot of frustration with, with mandates and, you know, from the healthcare side, staffing, understaffing, and a lot of burnout that we saw. And you throw in some visitor restrictions lack of services that were made available, and overall really a decrease in that human connection, I think, has emboldened individuals, unfortunately, to you know maybe act in a manner that they normally wouldn't. Those are some really good points. I know that healthcare workers don't always report being a victim of violence. Do you know why? I think the biggest thing is, you know, if I use the word programming, unquote, and where we begin. And a lot of healthcare workers that I talk to, you know, senior nurses, they are kind of brought up with the, the culture that, hey, it's part of the job. And I've actually been told by nurses that they've been told, hey, it's part of the job, deal with it. Uh, you know, if you don't like it, you should probably be doing something else. And that really, you know, it, that leads to one of my favorite classes that I teach at the university. And, you know, I get two hours with first semester nursing students three times a year. And we actually bring in professional actors and we role play a, a scenario. We, we like to call a disruptive patient and a nurse. And we talk about everything from how we communicate to de-escalation to the personal safety. But the messaging is, you know, it's not your job to take abuse. You're at higher risk to be exposed to it if you're in healthcare. That's what's important to understand. You're at higher risk. There are a lot of factors that go into behavior. But when it comes to, you know, I don't want to report, well, you know, it's my job to deal with that. Another issue is, you know, can a patient be held accountable for their behavior? Maybe there's a cognitive impairment or they're under the influence of something or they're withdrawing or having a, a mental health crisis. And most healthcare workers, they want to take care of their patients. They don't want to see anything bad happen to them. And they, I think they assume reporting with something punitive is going to happen to this patient. And we really try and message out with our philosophy. Reporting doesn't mean something bad is going to happen. Reporting is going to help us develop safety plans to keep you safe, to keep your coworkers safe, all staff safe. You know, we want to be very, very clear on that. And sometimes 
what we need to understand that not everyone that acts out is a bad person. Sometimes really good people, they don't have those coping mechanisms to deal with the bad things that are happening to them that they're experiencing. So we don't want an us versus them mentality. And, uh, you know, can a nurse provide quality care if they feel unsafe or they feel like they're being abused, you know, verbally or is there potential for physical violence? Those are things that we have to navigate and find that balance for. Those are some really good examples of changing perceptions at the very base, looking at the nursing students and how we can help them understand that it is not something that is okay and that there are things that they can do to help change it. Can you think of some other ways that we could potentially change those of us who have been maybe in the career for a little bit longer and do think that it's just part of the job? I think it's going back to the why. And, you know, making that a huge component of education. What's interesting is I found as I transitioned from law enforcement to healthcare, there are a lot of similarities between law enforcement officers and healthcare workers. And one of them is, you know, the population that we deal with. We see people at their worst, you know. I refer to patients that are disruptive as individuals who are in crisis. We see that with great frequency. It's not very often that someone wants to be in the hospital or, you know, wants to go to a doctor's appointment or wants to, you know, I guess, visit a clinic or or get a procedure done or anything like that. So when we talk about what crisis looks like, and I use that term very broadly, it's anything really that's going to affect behavior in a negative fashion. And really, so understanding your higher risk and it's overcoming, I guess, some of that jaded attitude maybe we've seen from some of our our senior nurses that, you know, nothing's going to happen to this patient anyway. So why even report it? Well, again, that goes back to from an institutional standpoint, do you have resources in place? You know, do we have things that mechanisms that will, you know, hold patients accountable? You know, have we determined, you know, maybe this person doesn't have a cognitive issue and maybe there's some intent to harm there. And then what are we going to do to show our staff that we're providing support, that they're valued, and then that we're going to ensure accountability for patients and visitors? Can you talk a little bit about the crisis cycle and its stages? This is, this is one of my favorite topics. There's so many different models out there. And, you know, if I refer to, say, the roller coaster model, which I think a lot of people are familiar with, starting at baseline behavior. And baseline behavior, you know, if you and I work together on a daily basis, I always know what your baseline is. And I can tell from your behavior if you're having a bad day or, you know, you know if you're having a really good day. And I kind of want to key on those things. So if I have a patient who maybe comes in two or three times a month for an appointment or maybe they're inpatient. I do want to focus on that baseline because any deviation from that, that gives me the opportunity to practice some situational awareness. I know that something's happening. Now, if we, we think about that roller coaster model and we start to go up to the top there, you know, I want to th- think about how that behavior changes. And one of the very first things that we want to look for is anxiety. And, you know, is somebody being anxious? Are they nervous? Are they pacing about? Are they wringing their hands? Are they withdrawing from conversation? And this is such a good time for de-escalation. And a lot of times people get hung up in the term de-escalation. That is this long, drawn-out process. It's going to take forever, but you can de-escalate somebody in just a few minutes, you know, even seconds. But really, it's catching them at the right time, and it's saying and doing the right thing. We have to show them some things as well. And so we really look at that, you know, that anxious phase of, you know what, let's talk about this. And maybe the best thing you can do is just ask a question. And I love to focus on behavior. If I call out someone's behavior, a lot of times people don't even know how they're acting when they're starting to experience crisis. And I may say, Lenise, you seem like you're anxious. You you tell me what's going on. How can I help you? And and when I ask that question, I I take away one of the biggest complaints that we see in a healthcare setting. And that's, you know what? I feel like no one's listening to me. No one's listening to me. No one's telling me anything. So I'm taking that right off of the table. And I'm going to listen to you and and I want to listen to you and I want to show you that you're valued. I'm not going to treat you like a number or a statistic here. I want to treat you like a human being. So humanizing is so important. As they continue to rise up, maybe, you know, they asked a question and they didn't get a response or they were kind of dismissed and they feel like they're not being paid attention to or their needs aren't being met. Then we start to see, you know, more aggression and disruptive behavior. Maybe the voices get louder, name calling, maybe some, there's some body language, posturing, things like that. You know, we can still de-escalate here. Our tactics are going to change a little bit. You know, think about like a mom voice and a dad voice. And we want to talk about really establishing what that individual wants and what we want. And then can we get there in a reasonable fashion? When they're in a full-on crisis, you know, the the number one rule, you know, and I I go back to when they're in that aggression stage or when they're in a full-on crisis, number one rule is don't be by yourself. 
Because another thing that I found about healthcare workers that's very similar to law enforcement is you all are problem solvers. And you maybe walk into a patient's room and you're like, hey, how you doing? Oh, you seem like you're upset. Well, rather than taking that cue as, you know what, I'm going to get help and I'll be right back. You get right in there because you want to solve that problem. You know, so, you know, definitely don't be by yourself in that situation and then know what resources are available to you. We're talking, you know, are they, is it the point of a physical act of violence? Do we need to call security, hit a panic alarm, a duress alarm, things of that nature? Maybe they're, you know, they're venting at the top of their lungs. You know, just understand that this is when we definitely want resources and help and we want to plan on how to interact with that. Now, also understand when they're at the top of that roller coaster, they can only maintain that level of energy for so long and they're going to they're going to come down. They're going to crash. And this is a good opportunity. We're going to see probably, you know, a lot of remorse, apologetic behavior. And you can think about as a patient ever apologized to you or a family member for something that they said or they done. That's when they're coming down off of that face because they're starting to regain rationality and realize, oh, my gosh, I can't believe I said that or I can't believe I did that. But this is a great opportunity for us to really go back to humanizing that individual again and, you know, attending to some basic needs for them and trying to, you know, negotiate future behavior. We want to talk about what behavior was acceptable and what wasn't. A lot of times we skip that conversation because we think the situation's calmed down and then we move on to our next thing rather than let's have a conversation about this. You know, why did it happen? What upset you? And how do we keep this from happening again? That's about the basic, most basic crisis model I can give you. And the important thing I would tell your audience is when you see an individual in a certain stage of crisis, have tools in your toolbox, you know what your response is going to be so that you're ready to try different things. Because if you don't have those things, you may underreact to a situation or overreact, which we don't want to see happen. Those are some really good points for things to have for each one of those points in the cycle. I think that the point where you talked about at the very beginning about humanizing that behavior and making that connection goes back to some of the things that we've been hearing as nurses forever, that when you walk into a room and you are talking to someone while you're doing a task, the person doesn't feel that connection while you as a nurse can definitely feel that connection. So taking those seconds to step back and make eye contact and call attention to what doesn't seem right is so important, as well as having the rest of those resources available. Absolutely. And that's such a critical stage. I am fortunate to be a certified instructor for the Crisis Prevention Institute. And you know, not only do we train all our security staff, but all emergency department staff go through CPI training. And this is, you know, one of my favorite parts of CPI because they really break down empathic or empathetic listening as active listening. And if I could give you one tip for everyone is the number one rule is you have to give your undivided attention. And all too often we are multitasking and doing different things and we're in a hurry or, you know, it's the end of our shift or we're working overtime. But when you just stop and drop everything and give that undivided attention and show that individual that you're there to support them and that you're listening to them and that you're there to help them, it makes a huge difference in setting the the path for the rest of their journey. Can you talk a little bit about some different types of misconduct that can occur in the healthcare settings? I think the best way to address this is define workplace violence. And this goes back to reporting as well. Another thing that we don't see reported is, or a reason why is, you know, a a lot of our employees feel like, hey, it has to be an actual physical act of violence for me to report it. You know, someone has to actually hit me or grab me or throw something at me. But workplace violence as defined by OSHA and other groups is, you know, all forms that include verbal aggression, verbal abuse, name calling, intimidation, workplace bullying sexual harassment, sexual innuendo, in addition to those physical acts of violence. So there's four levels that you have there, but what you're probably going to see most commonly in a healthcare setting is, you know, what we call a client customer, which is, you know, basically a nurse potentially with, you know, a patient or a family member. And then we do, you know, have instances of lateral or peer-to-peer violence, you know, workplace bullying is a thing and it can be a problem as well. There's a lot of different scenarios or examples I could give you, but I'm sure many of those come to the top of your head. But those are the two most common that we see. Can you share some factors that cause disruptive behavior that might lead to violence? I go back again to, you know, just not feeling valued and not, you know, being treated as an individual. You know, a lot of times we get dismissive. I, I've seen it and I probably have been that way in a previous life as well. And and it's human nature. We get in a hurry and we're trying to get things done and we multitask. but. When that patient feels dismissed, you know, I'll give you a quick example. I, you know, I had to make a visit to the emergency department a few years ago. I had a, a minor heart palpitation, right? And 
I'm sitting in the exam room to get some tests done. And I was a little concerned. You know, I have a family history on my father's side. He had coronary artery disease and he passed away at a, a young age. He was only 62. And so it's something that my siblings and I are very cognizant of and we're very aware of, you know, our, our health, our heart health, things of that nature. But, you know, I'm sitting on this bed and I'm looking at my blood pressure that monitor the cuff tightens up every 15 minutes. And here's a tip, right? Don't let patients see their blood pressure because I, I think through telekinesis, I'm making that go higher. Well, I'm just sitting there and I'm like, whoa, this is like, you know, my target heart rate for working out. What is going on? I was just a little bit nervous, you know, not upset or anything, but I was anxious. And a nurse had walked in and she was making a beeline for the computer because she was going to do some chart information. And as she's walking by me, she said, you know, the typical, hey, Chris, how you doing? Do you need anything? And my response was, well, you know, I'm a little concerned. I'm looking at my blood pressure and I've never seen it that high. Should I be worried? And she did the most fantastic thing. She stopped dead in her tracks, turned around, engaged me with eye contact, walked over closer to me. And she gave me a detailed explanation about how, you know, in the emergency department, it's something that they see very often because of all the things that are going on there. What I can see outside my window, the noises I might be hearing. And, and though I'm concerned at where it's at, that, you know, I'm still in a very safe range and, and they're monitoring it closely. And I'm like, that's a great answer. And literally it took her, you know, probably 30 seconds to give me that because the other response that we can get, and, and this exacerbates the frustration is if I said, you know, should I be concerned? She knows within a split second by looking at that, that I'm safe. But what if her response was, oh no, you're totally fine. And then she went on to do her business. And then I'm sitting there saying, well, that didn't really tell me anything. <laughs> I know you're saying that I'm fine, but boy, I'm still watching that thing go higher and higher. So take opportunities, you know, uh, to answer those questions and just give somebody a, just a few moments of your time. It's such a huge thing because if I sat there and didn't get the answer and 15 minutes later, I'm, I'm in there by myself and it's going higher and higher. Where do you think my level of frustration is going to go or my anxiety? And maybe that starts to transfer to more aggression and things like that. Another big piece of this, Lenise, is, you know, when we communicate, we're coming from positions of authority. And a lot of times we get caught up in power struggles and we say, you know what? No, I'm the nurse and that's how I do things and that's how it's going to be. And we become inflexible. If a patient asks, can I do this or that? And our automatic answer is no, you can't versus, you know what? I don't know. Let me find out if that's if that would help you right now. And when we take some time and really try and humanize an individual, but when we just, you know, get in these power struggles, it leads to frustration. And that leads to, you know, I'm heading up to full on crisis rather than, you know, staying someplace where I can be reasonable. And then those other factors, obviously, we want to be aware of are cognitive impairments, issues like that, you know, is there a propensity for violence? And we want to know as much as we can about a patient before we even, you know, interact if there's a history there. Those are some excellent examples. I want to be that nurse to take that 30 seconds to just acknowledge what you are feeling and give you a little bit of education about why it's okay. And then move on with my day because I probably saved myself a huge amount of time with trying to talk you down from a situation a little bit later, right? I would say just a lot of people, they want some explanations. And one thing when I talk to our emergency department staff, I say, you know, kind of be leery of using technical jargon and medical terms. Try and speak, you know, in a more simpler context that, you know, an individual is going to understand. But Explain procedures, you know, explain what's going to happen. Try and be thoughtful in that so that they understand here's what's, you know, the steps are and here's what you can expect. This is what you might feel. And, and so many healthcare workers are so good at doing that already. But, you know, sometimes, again, we get in a hurry and maybe we glance over something. But taking that time to really, you know, answer those questions, explain a procedure, even talk about wait times, you know, explain that this is going to be a minute. We're kind of busy, you know. And in the meantime, attend to some, you know, a physiological need. Can I get you something right now to make you feel better? You know, can I get you something to drink or a warm blanket? Anything like that is a huge step in really just keeping that person closer to their baseline of behavior. Excellent. Do you have any de-escalation techniques that we as nurses can use to prevent a situation from becoming violent? And then what happens if you're in a violent situation? What tips do you have for nurses in that situation? A wise man once told me that the number one rule of safety is to not even be there. Right? So know what your resources are and understand your role and responsibility. And maybe this, you know, and we need to call security before we go into the room and, and try and do what we need to do. But really understand, you know, if we have to be there, let's talk about just proximity and how close you are to an individual. 
And obviously for safety reasons, that's important. I always tell you know my staff, I never say stay out of arm's reach because you're vertically challenged. That may not be far enough, but you know, you want enough distance between you and an individual that you can actually react, you know, if they try and touch you physically or if they advance towards you. So you want to have some distance there. But what we kind of lose sight of is, is how distance is a form of communication. Because, you know, I may be talking to an individual and with my awareness of what my personal space and social space is, and I may feel like, hey, I'm, I'm in a perfectly safe spot here. I'm not encroaching on this individual's personal space. But for somebody who is in crisis, that may be way too close for them. You may be four feet away and they're like, hey, get away from me. I mean, what are you doing, right? And a lot of times when we, the closer we get to somebody, that's going to increase that anxiety to a point where we don't want to be confrontational. We don't want to be challenging. So really by respecting that personal space and being a body language expert as well, I'm reading body language. If I step towards you and I see you tense up a little bit, then that's my cue to maybe take a step back. And, you know, take this opportunity, you know, for prevention to assess behavior. One of my favorite jokes, I don't know if it's funny, you could call it a dad joke, I guess, is I always joke with nurses like, hey, you're so good at knocking on the door, but you aren't so great at waiting for an answer. Right? So if a patient's ever said, why are you knocking? You're going to come in anyway. Well, you know, we know that, you know, we know you're going in, but we have to have some empathy. And, you know, what do patients lose when they come into the healthcare setting? Well, one thing is personal space and freedom. So, that room kind of becomes their domain. And so I want to show, I want to build rapport. I'm respecting that, you know, knock on the door, poke my head in, may I come in? And I'm just conveying a little bit of respect right there, right? But more importantly, I'm assessing behavior. Because if I knock on that door and I say, hey, Lanice, you seem like you're upset. Oh, you know what? You are upset. I'll, I'll be right back. Maybe that's my cue to go get help, a coworker, security, something like that. Understand that a lot of times we're in one to one situations and people are exhibiting some behavior that we could call, you know, aggressive, but we don't want to be by ourselves. So adding one person to that equation substantially increases safety and reduces risk. And it doesn't always have to be security, it may just be a coworker. So, one thing I would say is don't be afraid to ask for help. And if someone asks you for help, you know, drop everything if you can and make sure that we're supporting our coworkers as well. And really, and you go back to the crisis model and, you know, the things that we look for, if you think about what anxiety looks like and aggression looks like, kind of flip that over to, you know, red flags and warning signs. I may have 10 patients and nine of them are like, hey, there's no problem at all, but I've got one patient that's showing me some red flags. That for me is my cue to to use a little bit of situational awareness. I just want to be aware of my surroundings. I want to know, you know, what is in that room, environmental factors that could potentially be used to hurt me. I want to be aware of the tools that I have to do my job that could be used to hurt me. Maybe if someone's full on crisis and we're we're coming in to deescalate, maybe I want to sanitize myself a little bit and put my stethoscope or my, my forceps or something else away for the time being while we have that conversation. But situational awareness is so important. You know, and even if there's family members in the room, you know, where's my positioning in the room? Am I by the door? Do I have access to that exit? Or am I, you know, on the far side of the room? You know, a lot of time we'll see our, you know, HCAs, for example, and they may be doing a one-to-one for a behavioral event, and they may be on the far side of the room, not even knowing that, hey, we maybe want you by the door, just in case you have to get out quickly. You know, it's a good rule of thumb. I know it's not always possible. Every room's set up differently, right? Every facility. But as a good rule of thumb, as I'm assessing behavior, we're going to figure some things out right off the bat. That's what I want to pay attention to. And also one more thing on just the prevention side is always maintain line of sight. We don't have eyes in the back of their head. I don't want to go into a room and turn my back and enter chart information, especially if someone's upset. I want to try and maintain line of sight, or maybe I'm going to do the chart information in another room, or maybe I'm going to have a coworker come in and give me a hand here. And then there's this other thing called the sixth sense, right? It's your intuition. We need to trust our intuition because if something doesn't feel right, it most likely it's not right. And sometimes our mind's just not connecting the dots there. But if you get that hair in the back of your neck that stands up, you know, listen to that. You know, if it's nothing, fantastic. But at least we know that we listened to those warning signs and we kept ourselves safe. Now, two-part question, right? Right. <laughs> Sorry, I get, I get a little, I'm passionate about this stuff, as you can tell. Excellent. And when we're in a situation, let's say, you know, maybe we were complacent or all of a sudden something just happened out of the blue. The number one thing is I can tell you is just know how to get help. Do you have personal alarms on you? Are there panic alarms in the room? Are there panic alarms 
throughout the unit or the floor that you're working in. Also, you know, if I'm in a situation where I need help quickly, are you willing to draw attention to yourself quickly? And that means maybe we're screaming and yelling for help. We need to get somebody there, you know, in a very quick fashion. And ideally, you know, that's, we need coworkers to come support us. The reality is, you know, we have a right to protect ourselves and we have a right to protect our coworkers. Our actions aren't much different than the expectation of law enforcement. Those things need to be reasonable. How you respond needs to be reasonable, proportionate, and necessary to what's occurring at the time. So you do want to think about things like age and gender and size and your previous history and a risk of injury. All those factors will come into play at the end of the day. Most organizations now have moved towards formal de-escalation training. And, you know, some of that does include, you know, physical disengagement skills if someone does try and grab onto you. And so I would encourage that those classes are offered, that education is offered throughout your organization to, to definitely take advantage of those. So, again, you have another tool in the toolbox, so to speak. Those are excellent tips. And I think they actually get to this next question of what key actions can the institutions take to create safe working environments? That's such a big question, right? And I, and I kind of go back to, you know, best practices from OSHA. And then, you know, if whether you're DNV or if you're with Joint Commission as your, your accreditation body, you understand that there's some mandates that have actually come out. But and it's a multidisciplinary approach. So, you know, for me, the number one thing is, you know, what's your culture of your organization? You have a culture of empowerment for your staff. Do your staff feel like they're valued and supported, that they can report these incidents and not feel that there's going to be repercussions against them or they won't be viewed as, you know, you're not a good nurse. Uh, and a lot of times like, hey, if I report this, is it going to reflect poorly on me? And it needs to be, no, we're here to support you and we want to keep you safe. And you can't provide quality patient care if you feel unsafe in any setting. So it's that culture of empowerment. It's that culture of support for your employees. And then how do you follow up on that? Now, another big piece of this is reporting. Is there a reporting mechanism in place that, you know, that, that's specifically devoted to incidents of workplace violence? And really, when I talk about you know, what, what we utilize, and I, I mean, I want reports to be very clear and concise and no opinions and don't use summaries. But I, you know what? Quotations are your best friends. And when we use quotations for those bad words that someone uses or racial slurs, you're really painting the picture for somebody else that's not in that situation. They're not in that moment. They have no idea what you're experiencing, but you want them to understand how serious that incident was. So we want to be very descriptive. But the reporting piece is, what do we want you to report? So all workplace violence, including verbal aggression, verbal abuse, understanding that it doesn't necessarily need to lead to punitive action for that individual, but it gives us the ability to now to develop a safety plan and keep people in place. So that goes to what does your policies look like and what is the response on that reporting look like? I think there's a trend to kind of veer away from a zero tolerance policy because, I mean, we don't want unrealistic expectations and sometimes we do need to be flexible. You know, you may have a patient who is, you know, in an inpatient setting and there's no way that we can discharge them. It's, it would not be a good thing. So let's develop a safety plan and get outside the box so that we can still provide that quality level of, of care. And then how do we, you know, deal with, let's say we have a patient that continually exhibits behavior. You know, what resources are in place? You know, one thing we do at uh, University of Utah Health is we have what's called the Security Investigations Unit. And they're plainclothes security officers. They have a little bit more de-escalation training and they're case managers. And they really track behavioral events throughout the hospital. And they'll go up and they'll follow up on, you know, if we had a response team for a, we have what's called a behavioral emergency response team. So if they're activated, we go up, de-escalate a situation, they're going to follow up with that charge nurse, with that room nurse to say, okay, here's the situation. What are we going to do, you know, moving forward to keep your staff safe? So there has to be those things. And what's important about that is your staff actually sees that something's being done. Because if they report it and nothing ever happens, there's never any follow-up, you can kind of see where that might go from a credibility standpoint. But when they see action being taken, well, now, okay, yeah, then I want to report this because this is some serious stuff and I want to keep other people safe. And that leads to accountability. You know, what does that accountability look like, you know, for a patient, for potentially for a family member? You know, if I have a family member who's being disruptive and I say, you know, if you don't stop interrupting with care, I'm going to have to ask you to leave. Can we enforce that? Is that enforceable? And do we have support if that family member complains, but we have all the facts in the situation because of that detailed report that, you know, there's support here. And this is how we lead to some of that accountability as well. 
And then uh, another, the, probably the last, and this is a very important piece, obviously, is that training and education. You need some kind of training, uh, de-escalation, and it has to dovetail with personal safety. And the reason I say that is because when we talk about personal safety, we talk a lot about how we communicate. And that's, you know, a big piece of that's our nonverbal communication. So safety, communication, de-escalation, all those things are important. And then what's your organization's response? Do you have a code BERT, for example, or is it, you know, a different type of code or code white for a behavioral event? You know, does everybody understand when they should do that? Do they feel empowered to activate that code? Or do they not activate because they're afraid that, you know, it's going to reflect poorly on them? Or are they concerned that, hey, maybe security arrives and things have calmed down and they're going to tell me, oh, you shouldn't have hit the duress alarm or you shouldn't have called the code BERT? Well, hopefully you work for an organization that says we will never second guess you. We weren't here when you were experiencing what you were experiencing. So you push that button. Great. We got here. Things calmed down. Fantastic. Everyone's safe. And we know that that works. But don't ever be afraid to ask for help. And that's a huge part of what it looks like for that training and education piece. You've talked a lot about what nurses can do to keep themselves safe while they are at work. Do you have any other steps that nurses can take to ensure their own personal safety? I'll give you a simple quote. No before you go. And really, it's, you know, have you reviewed a patient's chart? Is there a history? You know, say we have disruptive behavior. Maybe we have a patient who's, you know, sexually inappropriate with female staff members. Do all staff members know? Is there a plan in place? Think about the number of people that go in and out of an inpatient setting in a patient's room from your nutrition care services and maybe a pharmacist, providers, uh, you know, HCAs. EVS staff, a lot of different people are in and out of there. Is everybody on the same page that, hey, there's no one-to-ones in that room right now with this individual before you go in there. So check that patient's chart information. Are there behavioral indicators that we're concerned about or any red flags that we want to be aware of is so important. And again, there's a phrase that we use in law enforcement. And and when we talk about de-escalation and responding to crisis and crisis intervention, it's time and distance. And understanding that an individual in crisis, and again, I'm going to use that term very broadly, Lanise, because that can mean anything that influences behavior. I'm sick, I'm injured, I'm in pain, I'm afraid, I'm confused, I'm frustrated, I've had a long wait, I don't know how I'm going to pay for this, I'm under the influence of something, I'm withdrawing from something, I have a cognitive issue. All these things that are going to impact behavior can be an individual in crisis. And when we're in crisis, if you think about when you maybe you started to get upset with something, you know what happens to your body. You know, your heart beats faster, your, your blood pressure goes up, your auditory senses are affected, and you start to get tunnel vision. And now we're going into that power struggle because our human nature is we want to win. And, you know, one, one major rule of de-escalation is you cannot control somebody else's behavior. It's just not possible. We can only control our own behavior. And by mastering that, we can influence another person's behavior. And hopefully, you know, if they're at the top of that roller coaster, we're not riding up to meet them. We're staying down at the bottom. We want them to come down to meet us because that's when we're going to actually communicate and have a conversation. So if you ever heard yourself say this phrase, you know, you're not listening to me. I've told you this before. Pause, take a time out and understand they're not listening to you because they can't listen to you. They're not physically capable of listening to you. We need to get them to a point where they actually can. So that's a huge piece of another prevention aspect. And also know what our own boundaries are. You know, we're human beings. I could be the best at de-escalation and always maintaining my composure. But, you know, I've got a tipping point as well. And maybe you said that one thing where I'm like, oh, no, you didn't. Now I'm starting to get upset and become part of their problem. Well, recognize that and remove yourself from the situation and get somebody else in there. Because the last thing we want to do is get into that full-on power struggle and conflict. We're just not going to accomplish anything. And ultimately, we may say or do something that we're going to regret. You have given us a lot to think about and a lot to actually take back to our institutions and to our own practice and maybe even to our own families (laughs) as we think about dealing with keeping ourselves safe and keeping those around us safe. We have a few quick fire questions that we ask each of our guests before we wrap up. I'm going to get started with what are some common misconceptions about violence in healthcare? Number one, uh, I've said it before, but I'll I'll repeat it. It's, It's part of the job. It is definitely not part of the job, but do understand again, the risk, you're at higher risk. And why is that? If we know the why is, you know, we deal with people in such various states of crisis, that helps us take a pause and that time out and take a step back. And, you know, 
remember to use that empathic approach. Empathy is so important and such a valuable tool for us to, to really remain grounded when we're trying to provide that level of care. But when it comes to misconceptions, that's a huge one. And the other one is the reporting. And if you ever told yourself, well, nothing's going to happen to this patient anyway, so why should I report it? Or I don't want anything to happen to this patient. I'm here to take care of them. You know, really understand what your organizational response is going to look like. And hopefully it's, you know what, we want awareness. We want accountability. And, you know, and we're not going to call the police department for every little thing that happens. And even if law enforcement responds, you know, maybe it's just, hey, we just need to take a report. It's your decision if, you know, you want to pursue, you know, an actual criminal charges, if there was an assault or a physical act of violence. But hopefully there's no pressure going in there as well. Changing that culture. And then, you know, another misconception is, you know, all they're just robots. You're healthcare workers. You know what you're dealing with. I hear that in law enforcement a lot. Hey, you're just a robot. You're, you're motionless. You see things that everybody that I know that works in healthcare knows at least one person in their life that couldn't do their job for one day. You know, it's the same thing in law enforcement. And that takes a heavy toll from an emotional standpoint. So, you know, it's okay to be a human being. It's okay to get off shift or and be upset, you know. And sometimes you may think, oh, I'm okay. I get home, I'm okay. Just, you know, you realize, wow, I'm still thinking about this two days later, three days later, a week later. Well, you know, we're not robots, right? It's okay to not be okay. And so recognize that emotional toll. It's not part of that job as well. You know, there's a lot of resources that are available, but it's something that I think is a very important topic. Very important. What is something about this topic that's not often discussed, but you wish people knew more about? Emotional toll is one of those. And really, it's understanding what resiliency and self-care is. When I was in law enforcement, I read a great article. It was written by a member of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. And he equated, you know, the stress and trauma that you see throughout a career as snow falling on a tree branch. As that stress and trauma accumulates, that branch gets heavier and heavier. Resiliency is going out and shaking off that branch before it breaks. That's what self-care is. We want to be in front of these things. We want to know what our resources are. And so, again, you know, I, this is such an important topic to me because I want everybody in healthcare to have long and healthy careers. And my personal investment is my daughter, Lacey. She's an RN at the University of Utah Hospital. She's finishing up her second year. She's in the emergency department. And as a dad, I love it when she calls me and tells me, you know, her good things and, and the good days that happen. But, you know, when she had a rough day or she dealt with a patient or she had a bad experience, That tells me that she's not internalizing that trauma, that she's willing to talk about it. So whether you have, you know, a peer support or employee assistance program, make sure that you're taking advantage of those things. And then another thing that we don't often discuss is the importance of debriefing, right? And we talk about, you know, this debrief is a team, you know, what went right? What went wrong? You know, what were the triggers? What happened? Is everybody okay? And that includes physical injury and emotional injury as well. But we we are in a habit of only debriefing bad things. How about we debrief a good thing every once in a while? How about a win? Hey, that went really well. What did we do right? Why did that go so smoothly? And are we sharing that those debriefs and that information with other people who weren't there? Are there lessons to be learned? And then a huge, huge piece of that debrief is, are we debriefing with the patient or that individual that we know that we had this episode with? Because we want to take time with them to say, okay, (laughs) why did that happen? We don't want that to happen again. What can we do differently to make sure that doesn't happen? You know, what, what needs are we not meeting that we can meet that we know will help alleviate this and, and maybe prevent it from happening again in the future? Those are some really good points. And I love that picture of a snow-covered limb. Makes so much sense. What additional training or resources do oncology nurses need to understand violence in healthcare and respond appropriately? I will say any type of formal de-escalation training that you can seek out or that is offered is important because at its core... And I've been through several different programs throughout my career. You know, the basic foundation and the basic tenets are the same. And it really it comes down to our nonverbal communication, our body language, you know, and then our paraverbal, how do we say what we say? And understanding that, you know, the actual message or the words is a very small piece of communication. I think, you know, I saw one study that said 55% of how we communicate is nonverbal, 38% is paraverbal. And 7% is the actual message. Well, you can understand that if somebody's in crisis, they're probably not even getting 7% of that. So really become de-escalation experts, body language experts, not only for the individual that we're talking to, but, you know, how are we, you know, operating ourselves? How am I communicating? We need to be very self-aware about that. And then a huge disadvantage we have right now is, is, you know, masking. 
you know, and that's probably, you know, led to, uh, again, an, a rise in aggression, not because I don't want to wear a mask, but when I've dealt with mandates and I don't care what your opinion is on vaccinations or masking or, or lockdowns. The reality is, is most people are just tired of being told of what to do. They're tired of those, you know, having those personal freedoms deprived and you're telling me what to do. And now I don't see Lenise anymore, the individual. I see somebody telling me what to do because I see scrubs and a, a mask. I don't see your facial expressions. And facial expressions are such a huge piece of how we communicate. So how do we compensate for that? Right. You know, it's really humanizing ourselves. How do I do that? And 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 really a heavy emphasis on, on that paraverbal communication as well. And there's also one re- more resource I, I want to put out there. There's actually a, an online course that was created by CDC in conjunction with NIOSH. And it's an online course that, you know, you can take that talks about workplace violence and healthcare and a lot of the issues there. I believe it's, you know, it's, got, it's a self-paced course. And really, it's just another, it's another resource. I, I don't think there's enough training. You're never going to be trained enough. You're always going to learn something and constantly evolve as an individual. And the goal is to become a body language expert and a communication expert. And once you have those things down, you feel in control in the situation. And you're not going to freeze and you're not going to underreact when, when something is, is escalating. You're, you're going to have a response to those situations. Excellent points. And for those of you listening, we will share the link to that CDC course in the show notes. One last question. What are some additional resources for patients and providers who want to learn more? I'll talk about patients first. And one thing is, I'm going to go back to that quote, know before you go. If your beliefs lead you to think that, hey, I'm not going to wear a mask, or I've got an exemption, or I'm going to ask for an exemption, be as prepared as you possibly can. You know, if you're going to try and get that exemption before you get there. The last place you want to do it is while you're trying to get into a facility. And our poor, you know, patient relations team, patient relations services, our customer service team that are up front, they're having to tell you, hey, I need you to wear a face covering before you come in the building. You know, that's not where we want to have that argument. You know, be prepared. Maybe it's understanding what the visitor policy is. So much has changed in healthcare. You know, a lot of people have gotten away from really restrictive visitor policies, but at the time we allowed no visitors at all. So really understanding, okay, what do I need to know before I go there? What are the, what's going to be required of me? Because if we're already in some stage of crisis, I'm going to a health center or a clinic, for example, to get a procedure done, or I'm waiting lab results. So I'm already climbing up that roller coaster. Now, the last thing I need is to get into an argument about, you know, whether or not I want to wear a mask or an institutional policy. So I really, you know, for patients, for family members, just just understand what the expectations will be of you and really, you know, pay attention to the signage and the civility. Like, you know, our healthcare workers, they, they put themselves on the front line to, to take care of individuals. And, and, you know, just how do we get back to just civility and treating each other decently? But that's such an important piece. And, you know, and in regards to providers, you know, one thing I see a lot is just really listen to your staff, listen to your team. You know, we are all a team and we're here providing care, whether you're patient care or you're patient sensitive, we're all, you know, on that same team. And, and, you know, if somebody sees something that's concerning or potential for violence or risk behavior, pay attention to those things. If recommendations are being made for safety, you know, pay attention to those things and let's take that team approach. Because, you know, when you go multidisciplinary on a response and you have different sets of eyes on things, it matters and it makes a huge difference because you and I can walk in a room and we're going to see two completely different things. Well, if you walk in a room, you're just going to see what you see from a healthcare standpoint. If it's just me, I'm just seeing safety, right? But when we walk in together and approach this together, now we know what both of our concerns are. So communication is so important and just listening and slowing down a little bit too. Let's take a time out. Let's assess what's going on. Let's get a background and let's know what our options are and what is our plan moving forward. It's so important to have that rather than we're already in the moment. Now we're just trying to wing it. Thank you, Chris. This has been an amazing conversation. Do you have any final comments for us? I get on my soapbox a little bit and I always go back to resiliency and self-care. And that's really, you know, know what your organization offers. And at the very least, just don't be afraid to talk about those things. You know, there, there are other people that are experiencing the same things that they've been through that. And it's so important. We don't want to internalize the bad stuff that we're going through. Because we know we're, we're all in this together and we need to provide that level of support to each other as well. One last point I want to talk about is legislation. Certain states, not all of them, have legislation that's designed to protect healthcare workers. You know, in the state of Utah, for example, 
They recently expanded the definition of what a healthcare worker is to provide more protection. So, you know, a basic assault against a healthcare worker is going to lead to a, you know, a, basically an enhanced charge. So there are some protections that are available and, and there's some national legislation that's out there as well. I would say know what's available in your state. If there's legislation that's going to go to committee or are going to be voted on, you know, know how to provide support to that, whether it's, you know, petitions or, you know, even maybe testifying on behalf of a committee, but try and throw as much support as you can. Maybe you have, a, you know, a, a body or a group that can do that, or even as an individual, you know, know what's out there. Because, you know, the, at the end of the day, we, we want to make sure that healthcare workers are treated with some reverence because you are on the front lines and you do expose yourself to risk and you are at higher risk to, you know, obviously see incidents of workplace violence. So let's dovetail that with the protections that come along with that as well. So educate yourself on those things and support as often as you can. Excellent. Thank you so much. Chris will be presenting with his colleague Scott Christensen at ONS Congress in San Antonio on safety and violence in healthcare. Think about joining us. And as a reminder, you can earn free NCPD contact hours after listening to this episode and completing the evaluation we've linked in the episode notes. Thank you so much for joining us, Chris, and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Oncology Nursing Podcast. Tell us about your favorite part of this episode by leaving a review wherever you download your podcast. For more resources and information about oncology nursing, visit us at ons.org or voice.ons.org. Ideas and opinions shared in this episode represent those of the guests and not necessarily ONS.